Thank you very much, uh, uh, dear colleagues at the advisory board uh, of the ICD, uh, dear participants. I am delighted to participate in this uh, annual conference on cultural diplomacy. Uh, this conference uh, offers the opportunity to all participants to raise their awareness and enrich their knowledge, thus enabling all of us uh, to um, uh, form our own educated opinion on the issues under discussion. And this is exactly the very essence of cultural diplomacy communicating ideas and seeking to reach the collective wisdom through dialogue. This is for me the very essence of cultural diplomacy. I would like to congratulate uh, and thank uh, my very dear um, uh, friend, uh, the Director General of ICD, uh, Mark Donfried, and all his uh, able uh, colleagues for organizing this important international event and for giving uh, all of us uh, this uh, opportunity to focus on the critical issues uh, related to the main theme of the conference. I would especially like to underline the timely nature of the general subject of this conference, which truly reflects the global attention uh, to combat uh, terrorism of its worst manifestation. This goal constitutes a huge challenge, uh, and uh, every member of the uh, international uh, community uh, has an obligation to work in unison towards meeting the global objective, uh, this global objective, uh, but moreover towards uh, creating a more uh, stable, a more secure, and a more peaceful world. Uh, dear friends, not all situations and not all conflicts are identical. Countries and peoples are different. The history and circumstances that lead to conflicts are different. The only factor, though, that remains unchanged in any conflict is the human suffering that is, unfortunately, universal in character. People in conflict uh, areas, and especially women and children, suffer atrocities and grave violations of their basic human rights and freedoms, especially if policies of ethnic cleansing and extreme brutality are employed as a weapon of war. Today, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees is responsible for nearly 50 million persons of concern, which include 14 million refugees and 28 million internally displaced persons, plus other categories of concern. Hundreds of thousands of people in many parts of the world have become homeless as a result of conflicts. In search of safety, they are forced to relocate within their own countries or across its borders. Almost half of the world's refugees and displaced persons are children, being at a much greater risk of abuse, neglect, violence, trafficking, and exploitation, and more vulnerable and susceptible to disease, malnutrition, physical injury, and psychological trauma. Many have become orphans as a result of the war, and others have been separated from, or from both uh, parents. In our neighboring Syria, and uh, Cyprus and Syria are apart only about 120 kilometers, where a relentless and brutal civil war combined with the terrorist savagery of ISIS have been ravaging the country and destroying its infrastructure for the past four years, every day, the conflict is forcing thousands of Syrian people to flee their country and seek refuge, both in neighboring countries as well as in Europe. Out of more than four million Syrian refugees who have crossed the borders of their country, over 1.1 million are children with 75% of, uh, 
of them under the age of 12. The scenes of thousands of refugees being loaded daily onto crowded and dangerous boats, many of whom meeting their tragic death in the rough seas, and the scenes of the survivors who are making the long journey to the heart of Europe, walking by foot for hundreds of kilometers in utter misery and pain, aiming to find a better future in other countries, have been a wake-up call for humanity. Destitute, homeless, dispossessed, hurt in their very human dignity and honor, they suffer unspeakable hardships along the way. A sad reminder of the true that the true victims of this ongoing tragedy in Syria are the children has been the shocking death of uh, the three-year-old Syrian boy who was found lifeless on Bodrum Beach and uh, whose photo touched the hearts of people around the world. Ailan Kurdi was not the only three-year-old Syrian child that lost his life in this war. According to estimates, more than 300 Syrian three-year-olds and many, many thousand more children of all ages have perished as a result either of direct fighting or in situations like the one that Ailan and his family had to dreadfully suffer. To put an end to this uh, tragedy should be the focus of the world community by confronting the root causes of this devastating war, which has had horrible consequences, both for Syria, the neighboring countries, and the broader neighborhood, but also with repercussions extending now throughout Europe. The responsibilities are immense for all those in the international community that have either done nothing to put an end to this tragedy or who knowingly have intensified the conflict and protracted the conflict by loading rebel forces with catastrophic weapons supposedly to be used to overthrow the Syrian leadership, but which have been used instead to pursue the extremist ideologies of the jihadists and their affiliates, who have been terrorizing civilians within the country, the wider region, and across Europe, taking the lives of hundreds of thousands of innocent victims, many among them children. Nelson Mandela, the great South African leader and Peace Nobel laureate, had warned us that, and I quote, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children, unquote. Our European family should definitely not feel proud of the way it has handled the Syrian conflict that has resulted in the devastating destruction of the country, its infrastructure, society, and economy, but most importantly, the inhuman treatment of the Syrian children. Coming now to the many other conflicts around the world, and especially those intractable conflicts which tend to become protracted and uh, seem irreconcilable over time, we need to exert every effort to resolve them in order to send a strong message that peace and reconciliation is possible, especially at these times of greater global insecurity. One of the persisting characteristics of um, most of these conflicts uh, is uh, that a certain narrative is created over time which nurtures separate collective memories 
that tried to legitimize the cause of one side against the, the cause of the other side. Such collective memories are considered by the one side as the sole and undeniable truth, which is passed on to succeeding generations. A totally different narrative is constructed on the other side, based on its own account of the past and of the present, which is shared within the group and also passed on to uh, the succeeding generations. In most cases, such narratives are not telling the whole truth. They are biased and selective, thus distorting historical accounts by omitting facts or past events or by putting emphasis on other events which tend to justify the group's actions. Usually, an image is created that each group is the victim and the other group is the oppressor or the wrongdoer. Such collective narratives tend to perpetuate conflict situations, preventing the healing of the wounds as serving as a barrier towards eventual reconciliation. This is why in situations of intractable conflicts, it remains of paramount importance for the parties involved to move courageously towards uncovering the truth that is buried beneath these separate narratives, which is possible and this will facilitate the process of confidence building measures and reconciliation, which is possible when both sides actually acknowledge what happened in the past, but more importantly, when they are able to admit past wrongdoings and injustices that inflicted pain and suffering on the other side. To heal the wounds of such intractable conflicts, it is important for one side to identify with uh, or understand the other side's situation or feelings. In other words, it remains critical to show empathy, and this is a very important word in uh, all these efforts of reconciliation, to show empathy for the other group by communicating, and this is where cultural diplomacy comes, engaging in dialogue, reaching out, listening, and trying to gain a deeper understanding of its perspective and uh, concerns. Now, I'll talk a little bit about my own country. In my own country, Cyprus, which has been suffering from uh, foreign occupation and division for more than four decades. The intercommunal negotiations have been back on track since last May, and the progress achieved so far, as well as the positive climate that prevails in these negotiations between the two leaders uh, in Cyprus, allows for the first time a ray of hope and cautious optimism to surface, fostering the expectation that a comprehensive settlement agreement may be reached at last. It is therefore of utmost importance to nurture a different approach, and indeed a different culture from the one that has been followed so far. Instead of looking at everything through the prism of the interests and the benefits of each community separately, it would be important to try for the first time to find solutions that would be beneficial and I would say win-win for both communities to the people and the society as a whole. Putting the interests of the homeland above the interests of the community and the nationalist perspectives that have prevailed, 
would be the best guarantee for transforming this particular intractable conflict into sustainable peace. Central role towards achieving this transformation should be placed primarily on education, with emphasis on peace education, because, again, in the words of Nelson Mandela, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. The European experience of reconciliation through peace, security, and prosperity should provide the necessary tools for creating a different environment where the next generation of Cypriots will live in unity by safeguarding their very valuable diversity. This should serve as a guiding light and a guiding principle in the journey towards the realization of our goal, of our dream of a reunited Cyprus as a proud member state of the European family of nations. I remain a firm believer in coexistence. Our ancient land is the common homeland of people from different ethnic, religious, and cultural backgrounds that should be fully respected and greatly valued. At the same time, we have an obligation to instill in our people the necessary proudness of being first and foremost Cypriots, a common identity that would keep us united. This is the way that we could thrive as a country and as a people in the future, honoring and building on our diversity. We do hope that the international community, but, but most importantly, the five permanent members of the Security Council will continue to support and continue to give their backing, their full backing towards fulfilling this objective. The Cypriots must be allowed to be masters of their own country without foreign armies, without guarantors on their soil, and without any interferences, any interventions, or any form and kind of pressure in the future in, their, in the pursuit of their own destiny. I will conclude by saying that the world today faces unprecedented challenges and threats deriving from religious extremism and terrorism. New, artificial, and very dangerous walls are being built between nations, between peoples and religions, societies, and even neighborhoods. Based on hatred and prejudices, ethnically-based discrimination and racism, and exclusion and intolerance, such walls that aim at separating people rather than embracing unity and coexistence do not belong to our century and to the civilized world. They belong to a dark era that should be buried once and for all. This is why more than ever before, we need to unite forces to bring down all artificial barriers that separate people, both within countries and across borders, and as one unified force to combat the common problems facing humanity. Thank you. Well, as we thank uh, Dr. Erato Kazuku Markulis for her illuminating and thought-provoking speech. We open for questions. If there are any, please uh, give a sign. A sign? Nobody? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Please join me in applauding uh, Dr. Erato Kazuko Markulis. <laughs>